Welcome to Omnia, the podcast on all things pen arts and sciences. Tage Silverman is an award-winning poet and faculty member in the University of Pennsylvania's Department of English, where she teaches classes in both poetry and translation. Before coming to Penn, she taught at the University of Bologna in Italy, where she was a Fulbright scholar, and at Emory University, where she was the Creative Writing Fellow. In this Omnia podcast, she reads two of her poems and shares their backstory, including Where to Put It, a piece featured in the Best American Poetry Collection for 2017. First, Silverman talks about her poem, Tiresias II, which was partly inspired by students in her Greek myth and contemporary poetry class at Penn. You know those days when you come into class and everyone's looking really tired, like they've just written eight papers in the span of an evening, and they can't quite remember their names, and they are just exhausted and burnt out from being students at Penn. And it's a class that I teach every other year on Greek myth, and we read Ovid's Metamorphoses, and we read contemporary poetry that's that retells the myths in Ovid. And I just decided instead of going into the poems and the Ovid excerpts that we had read for the day, I would ask them what they would change into if they could change into something, what they would what would be their preferred metamorphosis for that moment on that day with that exhaustion. And so we went around the room and everyone, they offered up the most gorgeous wishes of what they would change into. And um, the class was mostly women. And unlike in the metamorphoses where they're all turning into... Um, some doomed version of a beloved from that into some other doomed version of a beloved. I was surrounded by 18-year-olds and 21-year-olds who had no interest in being a beloved. They were interested in these really interesting, dynamic, changing, real forms. And I think that that is what first inspired me to write the poem and to think about my own life and relationships and understanding of philosophy and the divine in relation to them. Theresius too. I'd be a blue whale, said a student in class today, for the way they travel thousands of miles and months without needing to eat. I had asked them to go around sharing their names and then saying into what they would choose to be changed. I'm Mira, and I'd be mist over frost. I'd be a sloth, a lilt. I'm Mimi, and I want to be a star you can't see. Like one from all the trillions in the done and gone that burn above our kitchen, where I've come now in the not-yet-dawn to wait for early morning to erase too late. Upstairs, my husband's sleeping. The sadness spread between us feels looser than the slumped brown bird I eased the stroller over so our toddler wouldn't see. What is it that I'm doing here? In Ovid's Metamorphoses, mute girl upon mute girl is turned to tree bark or a littered pool, or luckier, a wall of cliff off which the sounds of what and here come chiming back as if what makes it broken is what makes it clear. I'm Bree said Bree, and I'd be surface tension inside water, that force, you know, that keeps so many drops from sliding off the tops of pennies, how the thing that really holds them are the drops beneath. The girls take every kind of shape, a rape victim or river nymph, but why they metamorphose is suspiciously the same, beloved to beloved, saved. So praise the gods on high, those shits in charge of marriage, beauty. Who cares about the soul, say all the myths. Spinoza claimed that prophets speak according to their temperament, that those who preach deliverance are also ingrained optimists, and those who know the end is nigh are naturally depressed. Then woe, behold this wondrous sign, the kitchen lights won't say. Spinoza spent his short life grinding lenses, so he died that way. His lungs had filled with bits of glass he'd mixed with grit to flush and smooth, till vision wasn't hope but work. An admirable polish, said the man who first saw Saturn's rings about Spinoza's microscopes. True sight 
as something practical to which one simply shows up every day. I want to be that thickness in the air before a massive storm, one student said, and someone else, the imprint that a face makes on a pillow. Befores and afters held up plain as outlines one could choose. It's nothing like a bird, our bed. It's not a cliff or wondrous sign, but only what's unknown, and so goes looking for an ending's home. If I could see the future, I'd see nothing more than shapes that change. I'd go upstairs right now and put my arms around his chest and press. I'd make him laugh. But prophecies are loyal to the past. Moses thought that human beings weren't meant to see the face of God, and therefore, said Spinoza, God obliged him. Teresius, too, lucky mythical bastard, blind as a bedsheet, blind as the storm-clotted air. Go upstairs. He ground the glass into loneliness. He ground the glass into years. Longing reworked into omens that seem, for an instant of timelessness, clear. God gave me his name, Moses told the believers. God gave me a rock. I want to be all of the hopeful, gone faces that watched. Silverman's poem, Where to Put It, was selected for the Best American Poetry Collection of 2017. She talks about writing the piece during a time when she was pregnant with her first child, while also grieving the loss of her mother. There was so much that my body didn't have room for in order to have room for this baby, for this thing, which is now in preschool and would give me such a look if I called him a thing. Um... I didn't have room for grief. And that's a devastation when when there is grief and you don't have room for it. That causes all kinds of damage and danger in us and in the world around us. And so I was sitting there feeling the lack of space for it and and wanting to write my way into creating a space for it building a house where there wouldn't necessarily be um, hallways between the rooms, but I should put the rooms down anyway. I didn't know how I was going to get from the room where I couldn't bear to think of my mother to the room where my father couldn't bear to think of my mother. I didn't know how to get from the room where I wanted to have a baby. I was delighted to be pregnant to the room where I was devastated to be pregnant. And I still don't. You know, I, there's so many rooms in our lives. We don't have hallways to connect them. We don't have doors. They don't have windows. But things happen inside of them. And they must be in the same house, all of them, because we are ourselves in our one lives. So I stopped worrying about the overall architecture of that building and started just imagining the different rooms on their own and whatever um, Borgesian labyrinth might somehow connect them or not connect them, they had to exist because I felt them. Where to put it? The room in which I start sobbing again and wonder if my sobs will hurt the baby inside me, and the room in which I hope so, a room made entirely of a window. The room of my husband's good night, which is a room in a large municipal building with styrofoam ceilings where lines must be formed so forms can be signed. A room surrounded by parking lots, and he knocks, opening its door, and says, You can't be this sad for the next five months. It's not tenable. The room overlooking the perfectly circular hole in our street that's at least ten feet deep, and no neighbor knows when it appeared or if there's a reason. The room in which, instead of eating dinner, I drive for hours past porches where women with voices like hammered fenders call out baseball scores into the peeled blue air that will not link itself to a season. The room in which a man the color of sand stands on a median toward the end of dusk with a sign saying he has children and will do anything, and the room of the cars before lights turn green. 
the room in which we are filled with longing like a wave too large. Do you see me is what we can't find words to ask. The room in which a new student shows up for my poetry class for formerly homeless people who are mentally ill, and she has my mother's smile. The room in which so many women have my mother's smile. Women entering restaurants, women standing at counters with handfuls of change. The room of the dream in which the baby is my mother and I am the vent between the steam and the street. The room in which I tell my father, I miss mom so much I can't think about her and the room in which he answers back, me too lit as it is by the end of dusk and the cars passing through when the stoplights turn now the man's sign drops i'll do anything the room in which my father is living with a woman younger than i am and the room in which he is my father and the corridor between them down which no one ever walks and do you see me yes i see you and do you see me no i'm lonely and the room of my 70-year-old father and his 70-year-old friends pretending to trip each other and laughing, and the room in which they're invisible, age like the white ceiling and white walls, the window dissolved to a water-shaped memory of touch. The room in which I ask the no longer homeless woman what the poem about kindness is about, and she says, it's about anger, says this with my mother's smile, the smile of my mother's illness that could have decimated grown men in agreement with each other, and did. The room in which the woman's smile becomes an ordinary moth that lifts off the table and slips through a hole in the star-cracked slats of the ceiling's foam. Are we sharing a space? Do you see me? The room of the water-shaped tenable. The room in the house, the lit room upstairs, books on the shelves by the window, the room we drive by in the nighttime, someone inside. I do think that that you're writing every poem simply to get to the next poem and that the making of the thing simply leads to the next thing and the next thing. Every poet laureate ends up being forgotten, and they have accomplished everything, right? And we don't know who they are, the ones from the beginning of the century. So it, it's up to you. It's on your own terms. You're secretly, ultimately doing it for yourself more than you're doing it for that poet laureate possibility that after a while just doesn't exist. And I think that the hope in teaching poetry is to teach this pleasure of attention, the deep pleasure for its own sake and that it is more than anything about that moment like it's it is the carpenter my father was a carpenter it is the carpenter in their barn in the quiet with the smell of the sawdust that moment that happens as well on the page with the pencil and you are doing it mostly for the pleasure of that silence and dream of a house, dream of a cupboard, dream of a chair that can be of use, that someone you don't know will sit in and have an experience you can't imagine. And the poems don't last and the houses don't last, but um, but it is this like, it is this tremendous privilege and gift of being alive that you get to sit in your workshop and make. This has been a presentation of Penn Arts and Sciences. Special thanks to Tage Silverman from the Department of English. To listen to previous episodes of the Omnia podcast, visit our website or subscribe to the Omnia podcast by Penn Arts and Sciences on iTunes.